You want to sit up here? You want to sit up here? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, so <laughs> I have a throat infection, so I will traditionally not be uh, loud or non-traditionally not be loud today. Um, so please bear with me. Um, great to have you here today um, to worship Jesus as a church family. If you're new or you feel like you're new, um, we really pray that you feel part of um, our family here. Um, the way that we do worship is our kids run about um, and they make noise and we love it in the space before they go out. So it's great to have you with us um, here today. Just uh, uh, the announcements always on the slides, but just a couple uh, to draw your attention to. I uh, just want to thank everyone who helped with the harvest tea. And then also with first aid, we are having some first aid training. And if you'd like to help with that, uh, or sorry, to be part of that training, um, please do speak to myself or to Gail. And on the topic of Gail, Gail's going to come up for a very special announcement now. Uh, okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, okay, it's been a very, very long time since we have done a fire evacuation drill, and today's the day we're going to be doing it. So uh, just bear with us, it'll be as quick as we can. So the fire wardens, please, uh, man their stations, please. <laughs> uh, so basically, we have the four exit here, so the people from the first three rows, four rows here, exit here and then they'll make their way around the side of the church. Then the back rows go towards the back entrance where Stephen is and make their way out and into the car park where you'll be directed where to go, okay? And again, about the first couple of rows from here, go this way and then everybody else out the back door, okay? So we'll do this as quickly as we can and we'll get back in as quickly as we can for worship. So. Okay, good. Apparently a, a few people are concerned that uh, we've missed out on 10 minutes. Don't worry, that 10 minutes will be added on to the end. You're not gonna miss anything, don't worry. <laughs> Fire drill, great. We want people to be safe. Um, and our purpose here is to worship Jesus. Let me invite the band up um, as I pray, and we just open our service together. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you that you are with us, that you are here, and that we have the opportunity to praise and to worship you. So Lord, be with us now, forever more. Amen. Let's stand and worship our our first piece and worship God together.
Uh, just uh, one final announcement, and that's about deeper this evening. Um, I wanted to leave it to the last moment because I had hoped that my voice would be uh, better in time, but unfortunately, I just don't want to do such a big topic in justice. Um, and so we're going to postpone this deeper until next month, um, just because I don't want to um, uh, attempt it uh, with anything less than, than a full voice and, and a clean mind, clear mind, um, and a uh, <laughs> terrible mind. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we got to be honest, right? <laughs> Terrible. Um, and on that, uh, the kids are going to go out to kids' church, and we're going to we're going to keep going. Well, Sharon's going to come now and lead us in prayer. Then afterwards, the band will come up and lead us in a couple of items of praise before we dive into the word. Good morning. It's another one with a weak voice this morning. Can we bow our heads in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, your unconditional love. We thank for all that you provide for us, love, Lord. You're not a God who withholds. You're a loving God, a God of abundance. This morning as our family came into church, I seen this abundance, I seen the smiles, the handshakes, the hugs amongst our church family. Does this mean that we have it all together? No. Does this mean that we are not dealing with suffering and pain? No, it does not. What it does mean is that we were able to get up this morning, not in our own strength, but in yours, Lord, and freely come to worship a God, a God who will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, we pray for a church family who are unable to be with us this morning, those suffering from illness and sickness who are housebound, those waiting on results, those dealing with flus, colds, the aftermath of COVID-19. Be with those, Lord, who are worried and anxious. Give them strength and comfort, those who are in pain. May they all know your peace, Lord, a peace that passes all understanding. We pray for restoration, Lord, in all areas of their lives. For those looking after them, Lord, we ask that you give them knowledge, patience, and compassion. Your word tells us in Ecclesiastes, Lord, that there is a season in our lives, a season for everything. But we also know, Lord, that we know the one who is constant, the one unchangeable, the one undeniable, who is in the season of all our lives, Lord, and that is you. And we thank you. Amen.
We're in Ephesians 3, verse 14 to 21. Ephesians is not only changing my personal discipleship life, but it is changing the way that I preach. It's changing, and I hope that it's changing you too. Do you know, I stress about that. I really stress about that. I stress because I'm not a good enough preacher to fully capture even an, an ounce or a percentage of the glory and the life-changingness that is in these passages. And I am caught by my own inadequacy in that. And my constant prayer, and I've said this at numerous times, is that God will take through His Holy Spirit these frail words, and they are really frail today, and he will do something powerful in your life. Because I believe that Ephesians captures something of the entire Bible, and it is, it is glorious. And so in that vein, I want to pray verse 20 and verse 21 over this sermon, over this message, and over us as we come. And it says this, this is, this is my prayer. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and down Shire and beyond, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. That's my prayer, and I hope it's your prayer this morning. So let's read verses 14 to 19. For this reason, for this reason, and what is the reason? Well, it's chapter 3 in its entirety. It's the book of Ephesians in its entirety. But if we go from what has just come before for this reason, what is the reason? Is that Paul recognizes that the church and your individual faith is under consistent and constant attack. I hope that you know by now that if you profess to be a disciple of Jesus, that there are forces in the world forces in the spiritual realm that want to destroy not, not simply you, but the faith that you have. They want you to be apathetic. No, I don't care. They want you to be on the fence. They want you to be a great churchgoer, but just like getting your injections for COVID or whatever that you are inoculated against the power of the gospel. These forces want to disrupt the unity of the church. They want you to walk in here and be unhappy, discontent. They want to ruin your faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul says in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 that the power of the gospel will not let that happen. The resurrection power that flows through the Spirit, that transforms death to life, it is enough. No, it is more than enough to defeat those powers that seek to ruin, to dismay, to disrupt, to reduce your faith in Jesus. And so, in, in light of the opposition, but in light of the power, Paul says, for this reason, I kneel. For this reason, I get down on my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of the glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power, 
power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted, established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is a glorious prayer. It is a transforming prayer. What's going on with Paul? Paul's in a prison cell. He's in a dark, tormented place. He has no worship band. He has no um, charismatic preacher or even a Nathan. He has nothing. He doesn't have comfortable seating. He doesn't have the joy of friendship in that place. What does he have? The only thing that he has is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what does it do? Well, it fills him with fire. It fills him with a passion that I can only envy in the best possible way. I want a taste of that passion that Paul has. And the first thing that I think we learn from this is that that passion, that fire, that power that he's going to talk about, well, it starts with posture, doesn't it? It starts with posture. Verse 14, for this reason and all that that goes before, I get down on my knees. I get down on my knees, I bow my head, and I submit to you. Now, the bodily position is not important, okay? So this is not, if you can't get down on your knees, don't worry. But your posture is important before Jesus. How did you enter church today? How did you approach the first item of worship? What was your posture? Was it open, receptive, or was it huddled? Even in your psyche, you know what kind of posture you have whenever it comes to worship or to the Word. When you come to the Bible, is your posture guarded? What is your posture towards the Lord Jesus? Because if you are closed, if you are prideful, if your posture is not that of Paul, then what follows from Paul will not be follow for you. If you're wondering, why can't I get more out of this? Why can't I engage more? Why isn't the Holy Spirit doing these things in my life? Why can't I feel what God's doing more? Can I suggest that the problem might not be external, but that one of the finding, uh, uh, the finding issues might be what posture you have. Are your hands open or are they clenched? because you're still trying to control your life and keep everything in order. What is your posture before Jesus? What is your posture as you approach worship? Because in the Bible we know that when you bow or you bow your head, it was not just a symbol of respect or submission, but it was also an opening, an opening for anointing. When any of the kings would come to be anointed or whenever everyone, anyone was sent to do a task or to engage in something, their heads were anointed with oil. And as such, they would bow their heads. Can I suggest that if Ephesians is going to teach you anything, let it be about your posture before Jesus. Are you kneeling before the Father? And that posture then leads to investment. What are you investing in the Word? What are you investing in your discipleship life? Do you pray? 
And I'm not talking, do you pray when you get to the dentist, but do you pray? Do you pray regularly? Do you pray morning and night? Do you pray consistently? Do you pray in the car? Do you pray coming home? Do you pray? And not just when things go wrong, but do you pray when things are right, when things are beautiful? Do you pray? Do you pray? Verse 14, for this reason I kneel, and verse 16, and I pray. Do you pray for other people? Do you pray for your church? That's what Paul's doing here, is he's praying for his church. He's praying for us in Downshire. He's not just praying for Ephesus or wherever. He's praying for the church. What are you investing? What are you investing in your discipleship journey? Because I think what Paul's going to show is that when you invest in the Word, when you invest in Jesus, there is so much that comes back posture and investment. Let's keep reading. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in the heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of the glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. What is he praying? He's praying that you will be a conqueror. He's praying that the Lord will condition you so that you are a place where God's spirit and presence dwell. He knows that everything is out to remove that. He knows, Paul knows from his very conviction that there are forces and powers that, that want the opposite of verse 17. They want Christ to not dwell in your heart through faith. Okay? Please do not underestimate the scale of the battle that you face. And Paul says, if you're going to have Christ and if you're going to withstand everything that the world's going to throw at you, if you're going to withstand the tests and the trials, then you need to have the power of the Holy Spirit working in that. How do you obtain that? You pray through it. How do you pray through it? You have the right posture. Why do you have the right posture? Because you know what the gospel is. Look at it long enough and you will kneel. Look at it long enough and you will start to transfor be transformed. You say, well, Nate, uh, listen, your sermon didn't make a difference. Don't care. Look at it longer. Pray through it longer. If you look at the gospel long enough, it will transform your life. I promise you that. You look at the gospel, and you say, Lord, change me through this. You look at it long enough, and you will kneel. You look at it long enough, and you will pray. You look at it long enough and it will affect every relationship you have, especially the one with the Lord Jesus Christ. He will dwell in your heart no matter what comes because he will be the bedrock and the foundation of your life. Look at it longer. Look at it longer. Look at it longer. But then he goes on. And... And I pray, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, and I think that's where, where Paul says that that's what happens whenever Christ dwells in you, is that you're established, you're rooted in that love. What happens is that then, the, the, then he prays that you have power again to start grasping how big that love is. Is that once Christ starts to live in you, then he wants that you would understand how big that love is. And so again, he says, look at it, because it's a knowledge thing. It's a knowing thing. Do you know how much you are loved? Do you know how much God loves the world? Do you know what it is for the cross to happen and the resurrection to happen? Do you know 
that Jesus loves you. Do you know that? Do you know that he loves you beyond love? And a love that you can't even begin to fathom on this, on this earth. And that's why he says, because it's wide, it's long, it's high, it's deep, it's beyond. And this is what I want to close with. It's beyond knowing. Nathan, not making sense. How can we know it and then not know it? Well, Paul says the same thing. He says that you would know it in verse 18. And then in verse 19, and then to know that this love surpasses knowledge. So what's he saying? He's saying, know the love, but you can't know it. And I love that because what Paul's saying is that this love, you can learn about it, and you can read about it, and you can look at it. And he encourages you to do that. That will transform you. But then as you look at it, you will realize that you can't ever know it. And instead, you need to experience it. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. And that's why he ends, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What is it to be full of the fullness of God? Well, I think that verse 18 gives us the key in verse 18, he gives us dimensions. He talks about almost a container, wide, long, high, deep, volume, area. And then he says in verse 19, I pray that you'd be filled with it. Filled with what? What does it mean to be filled with the fullness of God? It is to have a revelation through the spirit of that love in your life. You ever had that? You ever been looking at the Bible or thinking about Jesus and you're thinking about the love that the Lord has for you? You're thinking, it's a thought process. And then all of a sudden, you feel it in your gut. You feel it in your heart. You feel the shakes coming on because suddenly that knowledge has been applied to your heart. That's a glimpse of what it is to be full of the fullness of God, that the measure of the fullness of God might fill you. This church and this process of discipleship is not about just simply learning as much as you can. No, it is about praying that the Holy Spirit would come upon you and that you would have a revelation of the love that He has, that you would have an experience of that love, okay? And if you've been in a relationship, you have your mom or your dad or brother or sister or whoever, you know theoretically about love, but it is the hug, it is the experience that cements it and makes it real. The prayer is that you would have that revelation of God's fullness. But again, Paul doesn't just say it just falls out of the sky. He doesn't just say, oh, when the conditions are right, when the music is right, whenever the lights are dim, whenever the feeling takes you, no. He says again, this is a process and posture, is that if you wanna be filled to the fullness, here's what you do. You submit to the Lord in your posture. You pray with all that you have, and you look at the gospel until you do all those things. That's how you do this. If you invest in the posture and the prayer, the Lord will give you a revelation of his fullness. That's how that works. Now, is it the only way that God works? No, because people who have never encountered Jesus will have revelations of, these love, of this love. But if you're tired of it being a sporadic experience, if you're tired of it just happening at certain times and you want to be regularly filled with the fullness of God, if you're tired of the Christian walk being boom, 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 boom and you want, you want a consistent walk with Jesus where you're consistently filled, this is the key. This is the key. It doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. But when you're filled with the fullness of God, you see bad things differently. 
It doesn't mean that your life will always be walking on cloud nine of a spiritual self, but instead you will be filled with something much more profound and then brilliant and amazing, that resurrection power of the gospel. Look at it longer. Pray through it deeper. Let your posture reflect your heart that you might be filled with the measure of the fullness of God. And again, I end with this weight that I haven't preached it well enough. And so again, I pray verse 20 and 21. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us. What is his power doing? Well, we've just learned it. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Stop settling for less. Pursue that. Pursue Jesus. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, apply this to our hearts that we might be full to the brim, full to the brim of the fullness of God, full of your love and power. Amen. Let's invite the band up. share the benediction together. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>